Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So build video time. In my last video, I discussed how we could use the Aura Vitality spell in combination with Disciple of Life, which is available with a single level of Cleric. You take the Life domain, and then we would get extended spell meta magic. And if we combine those things, we can use one third level spell and one sorcery point to recover 240 hit points on average, or potentially more with Warlock Invocations in order to restore a party of even higher levels to full hit points between combats. And at the end of that video, I promised to build that would make use of this combination. So I'm just going to review it quickly. We cast Aura Vitality. With a Life Cleric Dip, this now heals 2d6 plus 5 damage with our bonus action over the duration. Then we'll use Extended Spell Metamagic to extend the duration to 2 minutes. That gives us about 240 hit points of healing on average which should be enough to get even a higher level party back to full hit points between even challenging combats. Like if you have a party of five, this could be like 50 points of healing to everybody. The concept for this build is an unhinged party member. They love, and I mean love, the rest of the party in a way that might not be healthy, but very healthy when it comes to healing damage. I picture this character becoming very concerned when anyone in the party gets hurt, ensuring everyone remains a few or no wounds throughout the adventuring day so you can be together forever and ever. In combat though, I also want this character to be effective, and I want them to be like enraged when their beloved are attacked and bringing down damage on those enemies with Eldritch Blasts and Fireballs. This should include single target damage and area of effect damage. So we have that versatility. I'm also going to make a character that doesn't ignore defense with good armor class and saving throws. And with this character concept, we'll shower our party with statements of love and devotion that might be a little, well, unsettling. As mentioned, this character is not going to be emotionally balanced. In fact, we might call them the overly attached girl fiend. Now, with my builds, I try to avoid setting specific material because I generally like to assume that setting specific material is not necessarily going to be available to my viewers, so I want to avoid builds that you can't make. And this build can absolutely be made to work just fine without any setting specific material. But I've come up with a concept here, and thematically this concept comes more to life if we can use material from Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos. So just starting off, this build at least the build that's linked in the video description and I'm going over here does use that. However, I am going to explain how you'd make this build be just as effective without using that material. I think it's going to be pretty clear why I think it's fitting thematically to use that material for this particular concept as we get further into the build. Okay, so first off, let's discuss our racial selection. Honestly, we're pretty wide open here. So it makes custom lineage and varying human particularly attractive for the bonus feat. I am using custom lineage here, but if you are not a fan of custom lineage, it is absolutely not required for this build to work. But whatever race you use, I would make sure you get a charisma bonus. For this build, I'll be getting the plus two bonus to charisma, and I'm going to take resilient constitution as a feat. This is going to help our saving throws and help protect our concentration. If you aren't getting the bonus feat at level 1 because you chose a different race, I still recommend taking this feat. Just take it when you get your ability score increase instead. We're going to be medium sized and we're going to take dark vision as our variable trait. Okay, so ability scores. So these are done with point by and we end up with a 17 charisma and charisma is going to be our primary ability score. We're going to be focusing on charisma. We're going to have a 13 wisdom because we are going to be multi-classing with cleric you need a minimum 13 to multi-class into or out of Cleric, so we must have that. 14 Constitution and 14 Dexterity. I have dumped Strength and Intelligence. You can have one extra point, so, you know, put it in Strength or Intelligence, doesn't matter which. Our character begins her career as a perfectly normal and well-balanced individual with good intentions towards everyone, thus embarking her career as a Cleric with a Life Domain. The reason I want to start with Cleric is it ensures our armor class is good uh, because if we don't have Cleric, then we're going to be stuck with, at best, light armor, 
and that's not going to be good for our armor class. So it's going to be 16 to start because we're not going to be using our shield at level 1. But at level 2, then we will start using our shield and it'll be up to 18 once we get half plate up to 19. We're also going to eventually get the shield spell, so we have that ability to boost it to a 24. Disciple of Life is the signature feature here. Eventually, this is going to be a huge boost to our Aura of Vitality spell. But even at first level, this is plus three bonus to spells like Healing Word or Cure Wounds. For cantrips, we're going to start with a Guidance cantrip. This gives us a bonus D4 on ability checks that we can use for ourselves or to buff party members. Then we'll pick up the Light spell. This is Handy Utility. And then we're going to grab the Thaumaturgy cantrip. Level one, we take this mainly to open doors at range or some other minor utility effects. Later on, you'll kind of understand how there could be some conceptual ways we might use this cantrip. Okay, so let's talk about our level one spells. First off, we're going to get Bless. We're going to get this automatically as a domain spell. And it is honestly the spell we want. Bless doesn't rely on our wisdom at all, so it doesn't hurt that we have the 13 wisdom. It is probably the best spell on the cleric spell list, at least at level one. And it gives us something strong we can do in combat on the first round, especially if we're in a tougher combat. Uh, the second spell we're going to get through our domain is Cure Wounds. And a lot of people actually undervalue this spell because Healing Word has obvious advantages over Cure Wounds. But there is a couple things to note about Cure Wounds. I mean, the obvious thing is that a D8 means probably two more hit points on average from healing in comparison to Healing Word. But the thing I think a lot of people miss is that Healing Word requires that you see your target. So if you're in a fog or magical darkness or any other reason you can't see, you can still use Cure Wounds, but you can't use Healing Word. So I do actually like to have Cure Wounds on my spell list. However, we will pick up Healing Word as well. This will be one of our two selections. Uh, why will we have both? Well, again, Healing Word has other advantages. Its advantages, of course, are that it's a bonus action to cast and it has the range. So we'll have both. I mean, we're a life cleric, so it kind of makes sense for us to have both anyways. And then finally, I'll take Detect Magic. I'll be switching that out. But Detect Magic gives us a ritual option. So we can cast this without expending a spell slot. And of course, at level one, we just do not have very many spell slots. So there are two final things I want to mention about cleric casting before we move on and our cleric spell selection. Uh, so the first thing I want to mention is that we can switch out our prepared cleric spells after a long rest. Bless and Cure Wounds uh, are basically fixed because they're domain spells, but Healing Word and Detect Magic, we could switch out for whatever we think we're going to need. And if you find that you're not using something like Healing Word and Cure Wounds is filling the bill for you, well then go ahead and switch it to something else. Second thing I want to mention is you'll notice I didn't take any attack cantrips and I didn't take any spells that require saving throws or to hit rolls. And that's because with a 13 wisdom, we're just not good at those with our cleric spells. We'll take those kinds of spells once we get into charisma casting. But with wisdom being 13, uh, with our cleric spells, we want to do our best to avoid wisdom making our spells worse. Now, Healing Word and Cure Wounds both have a wisdom component to them, but because we are a life cleric, that additional bonus we get on those spells makes up for that. Now, where we struggle at level one is what we do on the rest of our turns after we cast like a bless spell, because we only have two spell slots. We basically have two options. Either we could pick up a dagger and pop into melee for a piddly D4 plus two damage, or we don't equip the shield and then we can grab a light crossbow. And that's honestly what I would recommend. If we get a D8 plus two damage with a plus four to hit, that's not that impressive, but it is better than nothing. At level one, I guess it's fine. As I said, hopefully level one isn't going to last all that long. Now we need to discuss background because here's where Strixhaven comes in. And for this build, it is relevant. So I have taken Quandric student background. Our character was a student in the Quandrix College with an interest in math and physics. Now I get that this is not necessarily available to you depending on your table. And if it's not, you can go ahead and take any background you like. It's fine. 
but it is going to involve a different mechanical choice later on, and I will go over that. But conceptually, for this particular concept, this really works for me. But uh, I would assume that if you're going to play this build, you might change the concept anyways. So this background first, it gives you the Strixhaven Initiate feat, which is nice, but it is honestly completely unnecessary. So if your DM would allow this background, but wouldn't give you the free feat, that isn't a problem. Why we want this background is it allows you to select spells on the Quandric Spells table when we select spells for spell casting classes. The main spell we want here is Aura Vitality. Mechanically, it's just as valid to get Aura Vitality, another method, but conceptually with this character, it's going to fit better. You'll see why when we get there. Anyways, with this build, I use the Strixhaven background and it gets the Strixhaven Initiate feat. So, and grab Druid Craft and Mage Hand as additional cantrips, and we choose one Druid or Wizard spell. Now my selection here is Silvery Barbs. I'm using Strixhaven, might as well take Silvery Barbs. Uh, but, if you're not using Strixhaven, you might want to select the Goodberry spell. And you might want to select the Goodberry spell anyways, depending how it's played at your table. Now in that my last video, I discussed at length my issues with the assumption that Disciple of Life boosts the Goodberry spell. But, you know, Sage Advice does say it works. So if you do this, then there's a good chance you'll be able to use the Life Berry combo. And it'll be fine at your table. Personally, like I said, I don't like to use things that I don't think should work. But this build doesn't need Goodberry to work. And eventually we'll be using Aura Vitality for healing anyways. And our first level slots will probably be using for shield. So again, don't sweat it if this background and feet are not available to you. And that's our first level character. However, something happens during that first level. Our character is becoming more and more attached to the rest of the party to even very unhealthy levels. Eventually, we're going to switch out that detect magic preparation for the ceremony spell. <laughs> not that we'll need it. I mean, will we need it? I don't know. You tell me. Are we going to get married? That's silly, isn't it? What do you think? And our character's obsession leads to a decision, a pact with an entity that promises to keep the party together forever. Just a friendly devil pact. What could go wrong? And here's where our girlfriend becomes a girl fiend as we take two levels of warlock. If you want to use this build with a different concept, honestly, you're fine going with another subclass. But the overly attached girl fiend's unhealthy obsession has led to a Fiend Pact. We get Dark One's Blessing, that provides us some temporary hit points whenever we reduce a creature to zero hit points. Right now, we'd get five temps, but it will go up with our levels. We need to start thinking how we're going to start doing more damage to our enemies. We do not want to be stuck using a crossbow. So we're going to start with the Eldritch Blast cantrip. We're going to enhance it with Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast Invocations. So now we can do at least reasonable single target damage. I was recently asked on how necessary is repelling blast. And honestly, it depends. I can't really just answer that in this video with a yes or no. You got to look at the rest of your party. How useful is pushing enemies going to be? If you have other party members and they're doing things like web spells and Evert's tentacles, then repelling blast is great. Uh, but then there are other cases where repelling blast is useless. So it, it really depends. If you don't think you're going to get a lot of value out of Repelling Blast, then Eldritch Mind is still a good option to give you advantage on your concentration saves. For a second cantrip, we'll pick up Minor Illusion, gives us some minor utility and obscurement options in combat. We're going to have three spells known and two pack slots that recover on a short rest. So that gives us four first level spell castings and two more after each short rest. So for spell selections, first off, I'm going to grab Entangle. This is available to us through our Quandrix background. So if you cannot take this, then you would grab Armor of Agathis instead. Entangle is an area of effect, creates difficult terrain, and it can restrain enemies. Enemies that fail their saving throw do not get additional saves. They have to use their action and succeed on a strength check to free themselves. This is a nice spell against multiple creatures that don't have high strength. So against that bunch of goblins or kobolds, this spell is perfect. Second spell we're gonna grab is Hex. Hex plus Agonizing Blast plus Eldritch Blast brings our damage right to the baseline that I use to determine what is decent damage. In fact, it's the exact measure I use. So basically, this character should be able to achieve baseline or thereabouts pretty consistently 
from now right through the rest of their career. I should also note that because we're using Eldritch Blast instead of the crossbow, we can put our shield back on, get our armor class up to higher. And the final spell we're going to take is Burning Hands. This is available through Fiend Patron. It's a 3d6 area of effect damage with a dexterity saving throw. So we have Entangle against low strength and Burning Hands against lower dexterity. It's not a great spell, but it will work with Dark One's own blessing. And often with an AoE, you can get at least one creature down. Now we're going to multi-class again. This time we're going to go straight six levels in Sorcerer. Now I talked at the beginning of this video why our Strixhaven background works well with building this concept. And the reason is, is we want Aura Vitality at level 5. Aura Vitality is an optional spell for clerics as of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So if the optional spells are allowed in your game, then you should be able to access Aura Vitality with a Divine Soul Sorcerer. Though I've noticed that if you use D&D Beyond, the Divine Soul Sorcerer doesn't seem to give you the optional clerical spells from Tasha's as options. But I think this is just a oversight on their part. Because if they are used, then they are added to the cleric spell list, and then therefore they're legal selections for Divine Soul Sorcerer. And honestly, mechanically speaking, Divine Soul Sorcerer is probably a good move for us here from a min-max perspective. But from a conceptual perspective, I like Wild Magic here. All right, so I need to add an amendment here. So I am recording this after my initial recording uh, because I just finished a conversation where they said that, no, it's not a mistake that D&D Beyond doesn't let you take Aura Vitality with Divine Soul Sorcerer. And uh, so I guess the idea is that, yes, Tasha's does allow Aura Vitality to be added to the Cleric Spell List as an optional class feature, but it's an optional class feature for clerics. So you would only get it if you are a cleric. Uh, and that's why D&D Beyond doesn't let you select Aura Vitality through Divine Soul Sorcerer. And that kind of floored me because I thought for sure it was definitely legal, but now I'm not so sure. Uh, so I think you better check with your DM if you're going to do Divine Soul Sorcerer for Aura Vitality. Now, you could argue that this character is going to be dipping Cleric, or we're taking this dip at first level. So maybe it has been added to the Cleric spell list for them because they've done that. But yeah, yeah I would check with your DM first. And I'm sorry, I've mentioned many, many times that you don't need Strixhaven for sure. Well, you might. Uh, so, yeah, check with your DM before you assume that you can get Aura Vitality through Divine Soul Sorcerer. I like to stick to my concept thematics. And come on, Wild Magic Sorcerer. It's perfect conceptually for the unhinged character. And because we have the Strixhaven background that will allow us access to Aura Vitality, this can work. So if you can do the Strixhaven background, I recommend Wild Magic for this concept. But if you are just taking the idea of the build, the mechanics, then no Strixhaven background is required. But then what you want to do is take Divine Soul Sorcerer here. But for the build here, I'm taking Wild Magic. I've added all six levels, and that's going to take us to ninth level for a character overall. So first, and most iconically, we have Wild Magic Surge. It is definitely debatable whether Wild Magic Surge is a net benefit. However, if you play a Wild Magic Sorcerer, certainly if I play a Wild Magic Sorcerer, if I'm honest, the reason I'm choosing the subclass is because I want to roll on the table. Because it's fun. So when we cast a Sorcerer spell of first level or higher, our DM can have us roll a d20 to see if a Wild Magic Surge takes place. So remember, this isn't any leveled spell. This is just the ones we get through Sorcerer. If we roll a 1, there's a Wild Magic Surge, and we roll on the table to see what happens. In my experience, you should not expect to get very many Wild Magic Surges this way. I have played in campaigns where there's been a Wild Magic Sorcerer, and session after session after session, no Wild Magic Surges at all. If we think about it, it's 5% when we cast a Sorcerer spell of first level or higher, so if we cast, say, four Sorcerer-leveled spells over a session, we should expect maybe one Surge every four sessions. But there is another way to get Wild Magic Surge. We'll go over that in a bit. First, let's talk about the Surge table. And I'm not going to go over all these because there are 50 possible results. 
But what I will say is that odds are what happens will be irrelevant. It's either going to be something silly, but probably inconsequential, like a neutral Modron appears, hangs out for a minute and vanishes, or something beneficial, but not necessarily useful in the situation you're in. The next most likely result is that you're going to get something beneficial. And some of these are really potent, like take an extra action immediately, or you gain resistance to all damage for a minute. There are a lot of really nice boosts on this table. And there's the chance, not a high one, but a chance something bad will happen. Like you turn into a potted plant for a round. That's devastating. I mean, it's hilarious, but devastating. But even more infamously, there is a 2% chance a fireball goes off centered on your character. Anyways, it's fun. And if I play a wild magic sorcerer, I want to roll on the table. And that's where Tides of Chaos comes in. If you want to play a wild magic sorcerer or a build that has a significant amount of wild magic sorcerer as this build does, then you definitely want to talk to your DM beforehand how they're going to handle Tides of Chaos. This feature allows us to gain advantage on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, which is great. But after you use this feature, you recover it with a long rest, which isn't so great. But here's the fun part. Any time before you regain the use of this feature, the DM can have you roll on the Wild Magic Surge table immediately after you cast a Sorcerer spell of first level or higher, you then regain the use of this feature. So this is win-win, because we want to roll on the Wild Magic table, and this allows us to automatically roll on the Wild Magic table when we cast a leveled spell. And secondly, this feature is really good if we can start using it over and over again, because that's a lot of advantage and it's very flexible. Attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws. So if you do take Wild Magic Sorcerer, the first thing you should do is make your DM aware of their part in the feature. And then personally, I would ask how often would you expect them to make use of that option? And based on what they tell you, that's going to tell you whether you want to play a Wild Magic Sorcerer or not. Now, I wanted to test this build, so I am playing it in three different games with three different DMs. And so I asked each of them the same question. Wanted to check if someone was to play a Wild Magic Sorcerer and use Tides of Chaos, and then cast the Sorcerer spell of first level or higher, should they expect to regain the feature? So basically, before I ever choose this subclass, I'm reminding the DM that they have that option with the feature and asking how they'll handle it. And their answer is really going to make the difference on whether I'm playing a Wild Magic Sorcerer or not. First DM said, if you want many procs at the Wild Magic Surge, I'll be Surge to provide that. So one out of three. Then, oh yeah, absolutely, right away. Love that. That's two out of three. And then, yes, always. What's the point of being a wild magic sorcerer if you never get to use wild magic? And that's three out of three. And these are not surprising answers. When DMs don't use Tides of Chaos Recovery as a way to have you roll on the wild magic table, in my experience, it's because either they don't know they have that option, and why would they, really? Like, I know I like to memorize the rules because, you know, this is what I do. But most players haven't memorized every subclass. You don't expect your DM to know what Tides of Chaos does and that they have the option of having you roll on the Wild Magic Surge table. Chances are they don't know that, so make sure they do. But the other possibility is they forget they have that option. Maybe you mentioned it when you made the character, and then you're playing and they just don't think of it. So when you cast a leveled spell with a Sorcerer spell, you should remind them. Do I get Tides of Chaos back? Because here's the thing, the DMs actually want you to roll on the Wild Magic table for the exact same reason you want to roll on it. Because it's fun. And certainly in my experience, DMs always want you to make that roll. So communicate with your DM. And providing you get a similar response from your DM that I got, use Tides of Chaos all the time. I'm going to be using it on initiative. Then I get the Wild Magic Surge right on round one. Then that's basically permanent advantage on initiative. That's great. Okay, so with six levels of Sorcerer, that's six Sorcery points and two Metamagic options. I've selected Extended Spell for Extending Aura Vitality 
and Quicken Spell. Quicken Spell combos really nicely with Eldritch Blast. So with two sorcery points, I can cast a leveled spell, and then I follow it up with an Eldritch Blast on the same turn. At level four of Sorcerer, we're going to get our Charisma up to 18 with the Fey Touched feat. Now, if you selected a race that doesn't get a plus two bonus to Charisma, then you might just want to raise up your Charisma to 18 by adding two here. Dissonant Whispers is probably the way I'd go. Now, what would our character whisper to get the enemy to move away at their full movement rate and do psychic damage? Oh yeah, probably something like that. Level 5, we get Magical Guidance, which allows us to use a Sorcery Point to reroll a failed ability check. We'll be grabbing Counterspell and Dispel Magic on this build, so this is a nice option for either of those. And at level 6, we're getting Bend Luck. Now this is not cheap. It costs 2 Sorcery Points and uses your Reaction. But it is pretty good. I mean, monster makes their saving throw, bend luck to lower their save. Party member fails an important save, bend luck to increase their save. Monster hits with a big attack, bend luck to lower the attack roll. Basically, be on the lookout for really important rolls where the roll just didn't quite meet your hopes. That's when bend luck is worth it. Okay, so let's go through our sorcerer spell selections. Firebolt as a cantrip gives us a cantrip we can use to destroy objects. Like that sending stone the other party member was using to talk to someone. Probably their secret girlfriend they're cheating on you with. Then Mind Sliver. This gives us a non-attack combat cantrip option. The intelligent saving throw means it's more reliable and then they get a minus on their next saving throw. Thunderclap does damage to all creatures around you so it would be an option if you were being swarmed basically. Mold Earth, Shape Water, they're both going to provide some utility. Our cantrip list here is getting really big, so it's a good time to pick up those, you know, once in a while cantrips. Alright, so let's go through our leveled spell selections. Level 1, pretty obvious, we're going to grab Absorb Elements and Shield. I think you know why we want those. Level 2, alright, so first we'll grab Mirror Image, then we'll grab Vortex Warp, and Web. All of these are great spells. Mirror Image is good defense, doesn't use concentration, and over the duration will likely take three attacks against you and turn them into automatic misses. Vortex Warp is a fantastic teleport option. Personally, when I use Vortex Warp, it's usually not to try to move an enemy, but instead I like to move party members. That way you don't need to worry about the saving throw. And Web is great. I have a whole video about Web, and if you haven't checked it out, you should. And if we do have Repelling Blast, Repelling Blast and Web work great together. The idea is we would cast a web, probably quickened, and then use our Eldritch Blast to push additional creatures into the web. And as creatures leave the web, we would use our Eldritch Blast to push them back in again. And for my third level spells, I'm going to take Aura Vitality, of course, uh, in order to do our combo, which we can now do. We will be able to do it at level 8. And I will be taking Fireball, and this is going to give us a narrative effect option. Our Burning Hands isn't cutting it anymore, uh, but Fireball is still going to be effective at this level. The only issue here is that we do have a limited number of third level spell slots. So depending how many combats you have in a day, we could risk running out of those slots. So the solution to that, go back to Warlock. And we're going to take Warlock up to 6th level as well. 5th uh, level will actually give us the spell slots we need, but there's a really nice feature at 6th level. And this is where I'm going to take the build and finish it, is at 13th level. If our campaign is going beyond 13th level, I would probably go back to Sorcerer again afterwards. So at level 3, we get our Pact Boon, and we're selecting Pact of the Chain. This is going to give us a familiar, which we'll probably have in Imp form, and it'll be invisible, providing help actions or activating items, and of course, whispering in our ear that the other party members seem distant lately. Maybe they don't love us anymore. We'll get another invocation and we'll take Gift of the Ever-Living Ones. This invocation gives us maximum hit points on any roll for us to recover hit points as long as our familiar is within 100 feet. That means when we're using our Aura Vitality combination, any bonus action we use to heal ourselves is 17 automatically. This is going to help stretch our Aura Vitality further, and it's going to help a short rest recovery as well. At 4th level, we'll max out our Charisma to 20. And at 6th level, 
we get a nice feature called Dark One's Own Luck. This allows us to add a D10 to an ability check or saving throw once per short or long rest. And like with Bend Luck, it occurs after the roll is made. And since this doesn't use a reaction, we can even add them to the same roll. Like, let's say we miss a saving throw by five. Well, we use Dark One's Own Luck, but we only roll a four on the D10. Well, then we could use our reaction and bend lock for another d4 and get that success. So in between the resilient feat, bend lock, tides of chaos, and dark one's own luck, we have really good saving throws. And let's talk about our spell selection. Obviously, we want to switch out some of those low-level spells. But first, let's talk about cantrips. I grabbed Toll the Dead as another cantrip, but I mean, take your pick. It really doesn't matter. Our cantrip list is full. Then for spell selection, I have Armor of Agathis. It's great for upcasting. Then I took Counterspell for obvious reasons. And it pairs well with Magical Guidance and Ben Luck and Dark One's Own Luck. I took Fear. I thought that was thematic. It's also a great spell. Mass Effect causes the Frightening Condition and takes away their action. They're forced to spend it dashing away from you. I took Spirit Shroud, that would give us a bit of a damage boost when we need it. Summon Shadow Spawn, which is also a good 4th level spell slot option, because the Shadow Spawn gets a second attack when we upcast, as well as increased hit points and everything else. And Shadow Spawn particularly scales well, because it gets more hit points with upcasting than most of those other Tasha summon spells do. Then I took Dispel Magic, great spell, like with... Counterspell, it works well with Magical Guidance, Ben Luck, and Dark One's Own Luck. And finally, I took Fly. Uh, Fly is actually a really good option for our fourth level slot because there's good upcasting on it. You can uh, select two creatures instead of one. Now, if I was going to take this character past level 13, I'd consider switching one of these out for Fireball, and then that would open up another Sorcerer selection for me on the following level. I could switch that Fireball out. And I think this is where I will conclude this build. And I think our 13th level character actually is wonderfully versatile, especially considering that we've made this character based on a particular combo that we wanted to get. Often when you do that, it kind of ends up being a one-trick pony. This is not that. I mean, just look at it. We have decent single target damage through Eldritch Blast and Agonizing Blast. We have Area of Effect damage originally through Burning Hands and then upgrading to Fireball. We also have summoning for additional damage options. We have battlefield controls, like webs. We have teleport options. We have counterspell. We have dispel magic. We have tons of utility options. And the full healing is just on top of all those things. So we actually have a wonderfully versatile character. And we didn't disregard our defense as well. Armor class is perfectly respectable. And we have shield to boost that further. We have absorb elements if we're going to take elemental damage. We also have decent saving throws and the ability to boost them in multiple ways. So we have reasonable offense, we have reasonable defense, and we have the healing and all that other stuff as well. So yeah, this character kind of hits a little bit of everything. Now we should expect this character to be using a lot of third level spell slots, but that's largely why we went back to Warlock because we boost those slots by getting Warlock to 6. So we have those additional two third level spell slots and they recover on short rests. So although we'll be using a lot of third level spell slots, we'll have additional ones. And if you love this character, well, she has ceremony prepared and ready to go. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to marry her though. I mean, you don't want to, do you? But wouldn't that be wild? I wonder what your kids would look like. They'd be super cute, I bet. What do you think? Anyways, that's the Overly Attached Girl Fiend. And until next time, I am going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.